So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, headspace sampling technique, which is basically a technique that you can um, find smell in archaeology with. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important, uh, what we can test and what kind of connected possibilities there are involved. Um, since Aristotle's time, uh, really smell has already always been considered uh, a secondary player. Um, it was the disciplines that really involve one's cognitive nature that actually started to look at smells such as psychology, sociology, and of course consumerist industries such as perfumiers, food retail. In terms of archaeology, smell really took uh, conceptual approaches such as experimental phenomenology, ethnography. And it wasn't really until 1991 that uh, neuroscience stepped in with Bird and Axel doing uh, tests on rats actually and found olfactory receptors. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a bit, but basically that's how you smell. Um, this is a picture of a 19th century uh, idea actually by a chemist uh, creating a, a smell technique whereby uh, the glass tube takes sweeps in smell and uh, the respondent smells it at the other end. Unfortunately, the only thing they're smelling is an odour profile. Uh, so why is it important? Uh, well, basically because it, it connects with your limbic system, it connects with your cognition. Uh, smells act as a mnemonic device going directly to uh, your long-term memory, learning and emotions, therefore pr pr producing encoded messaging that uh, give you an understanding of how you humans adapt, both metaphysically and physically. So how does it work? Well, smells go up through your nose into, as you can see, the olfactory receptors, um, and signals are sent off through into the limbic brain. If we look more closely at that, you can see olfactory receptors there, and uh, the odorants, which are basically the odor molecules, being picked up by fronds, which are basically at the end of these olfactory receptors before they get kicked off into the brain. So how many olfactory receptors does it take to light a olfactory bulb? Well, uh, studies show that humans actually had 400 olfactory receptors, have 400, um, which can pick up about a trillion odorant stimuli, and that's about 10,000 odors. In terms of profiles, your, your odor profiles, that it's really only discussed, ver verbalized, sort of a 5% of that. But as you can see on this phylogenetic tree, humans sit right at the bottom compared with other animals. So how do those, show, uh, how do those molecules get up there? Well, theory in the 50s put forward uh, the fact that these molecules were actually uh, shaped so that those cilia on the ends of the olfactory receptors are actually picking up and locking into place like a lock and key system. But let's not forget these are volatile organic mo molecules. They're unstable. How do they stay there? How, do, how can we test them? Well, headspace sampling technique, not necessarily a new technique, but to archaeology, a new technique, um, can actually uh, take trace elements, which is perfect for archaeology because we're not destroying the archaeological record, uh, and put it into a vial, and we can actually once it's heated up, actually separate out the analytes um, into a headspace area, which are kicked off uh, using a carrier gas into the GCMS process, where they're detected, analyzed, uh, given a mass, and kicked out as a computer readout. That readout would look like this on your right, with the peaks. Um, the peaks are showing the more prevalent odor biomarkers. The ones on the left are just put there as a treat to show you what the biomarkers look like for frankincense. So what can we test? Well, smells linger, ancient smells linger in a lot of places. These are uh, mummy bindings from first millennia BC um, from the Yemen area. Unfortunately, right now I don't have the data set available, but what it can tell us is that we can start to build from an odor analysis meta-narratives around what those odorants were, uh, what their treatment of the bodies were, whether there's any correlation with any of the countries around it. For example, we at this time, it's known that Yemen was uh, trading in frankincense and myrrh with Egypt. And then you start to be able to build up a bigger <clears throat> picture from this smaller amount of information that you've tested. Uh, so what else can we look at? Well, we can look at pretty much anything. Um, 
any site, anywhere in the world, wherever the organic preservation exists. And, um, and uh, for example, we can look at cave sites where we can actually collect samples of the air, as well as the, the compacted uh, archaeological material in, in working sites, on working sites, in the soil. Um, so how does science meet theory then? Well, essentially, this, this, this technique will give us the ability to make the tangible, intangible tangible, to create, to build, provide metadata, to build those strong, robust meta-narratives. It allows us to actually break down the elitism of disciplines and bring them together, science and theory. Um, and actually, for archaeology, it gives us another dimension um, to look at and understand past uh, ancient cognition. Essentially, it allows us to uh, shorten the gap between our temporal spatial distance that we constantly talk about. So I'd like to leave you on a final note. Um, NASA in April this year actually did tests using headspace sampling on gases around Uranus. And the biomarkers that came up were biomarkers for hydrogen sulfide. A lot of you will probably know that that actually odor profile is uh, rotten eggs. So basically, if we can do it in space, we can do it on Earth. Um, talk to uh, an archaeologist from Hungate uh, who'd been digging uh, medieval cesspit there, was talking about the emanations that came from it as he was doing it. And he said to me, if it smells like this now, imagine what it smelled like then. Well, now we have the technology. We don't have to imagine it anymore. Thank you.